Anyone who has ever messed around on a piano, or a clarinet, or just whistled or sung for the joy of making sound is a composer. What professionals do is a sort of advanced version of that first playful moment, which is how many of us got hooked on creating music. This podcast is about our stories. Our goal is to illuminate, explore, and help demystify new music for listeners and musicians alike. This is Composer's Notes. I'm your host, Michael Small. Nina Young was born in New York and studied at MIT, McGill, and Columbia, completing her doctorate this year. Her music has been widely performed with ensembles all over the United States and Europe, most recently the Phoenix Symphony Orchestra. She works both in concert music and electronic music, and is gradually becoming more interested in exploring interdisciplinary works such as ballet and cantata. While she has worked extensively in the electronic studio, this attitude to shaping sound influences her purely acoustic music too, allowing musical states to evolve gradually and seamlessly into one another. So, Nina, welcome. Thanks very much for coming on the show. It's a pleasure to be here. Thank you. Okay, so first, perhaps, tell us a little bit about how you got started with composing, whether it was uh, an instrument first or improvisation at the piano or something like that. Sure. Um, Well, when I was a kid, I trained as a violinist, um, and I had a really conservative violin music education um, to the point where I didn't really understand or realize that there was anything after Prokofiev. Um, And so I had no idea that there were contemporary composers and certainly not female ones. It was just not even a question. Um, And then in the summer of 2001 or 2002, I went to the Bowdoin Music Festival as a violinist. Um, And I was in high school at the time and I was suddenly surrounded by all of these conservatory um, and university uh, musicians who were doing their bachelors or their masters, uh, mostly performers, but there were also composers there. And there was also the Gamper Festival for New Music. And I was drawn um, instantly to the sound worlds that I was hearing, and somehow this tied together sort of my affinities in certain genres of electronic pop and rock music that I was drawn to also as a teenager. And it was just, I think, this transformative summer for me. I met composers uh, that were living. I talked to them. I had lunch with them. And, I, and we were just living and breathing new music all day long. And I went home after that summer completely changed, thinking, oh, I want to be involved in this somehow. And I remember asking uh, one of the composition students, his name is Jeremy Faust. Uh, he's now a surgeon, but he still does um, quite a bit of music. He's a vocalist and he's, 
yeah, it, he's, he's around. I see him sometimes. And I remember asking him, well, you know, how is it that you compose? Were you tapped on the head by God or something? Um, and he laughed at me and he said, no, you're just illiterate. Go back home and take music theory. Uh, and I was like, music theory, what is this? I had no idea. You know, I was, I was a teenager. Um, and so, I, yeah, I went back to Rockland County and I enrolled in Nyack College and I started taking music theory and music history courses. And it was like a light bulb turned on in my head. I guess I knew that all of these sounds were happening, but suddenly I became a literate musician and that enabled me to create. So this would have been around 2000, what, what year would this have been? I was 16 or 17 at the time. Um, and this was all acoustic music. Uh, I also work with electronic music, um, but maybe we can talk about that a little bit later because it, at first those two things were very separate. I see. So did you, when was your first performance then? When, what was the first time you heard your own music? You know, this should be something that I'm, fundamentally aware of but now I don't really know I mean there were composition exercises and class performances um, I remember those I remember having a piano piece um, read at my college um, then when I went to MIT I took this um, course called introduction to music composition uh, the course number was 21 M065 and I just remember that because I was at uh, MIT earlier this week, um, and I was talking in Carol Macon's class, and we mentioned that course. Um, and that was an interesting class because it was a music composition class for people who did not have to be musically literate at all. Anybody could come in and take it, so it was really conceptual. And I wrote a piece for choir, flute, and something else, and I remember that like, we, did, we performed that in class. Um, but I think my first concert performance was probably in my junior or senior year of college. Um, there was a percussion duo that came to the composition seminar and we wrote pieces for them and um, it was premiered there. So you've mentioned a little bit about where you grew up and perhaps this sort of segues into the next question, which is going to be about memory in your music, specifically memory of childhood. Um, one of your pieces uh, that I've listened to recently, uh, Traced Upon Cinders, creates soundscapes out of particular memories of your childhood, in particular uh, a soundscape of seagulls, which is very evocative. So is this something that's a recurring idea in your music or something you just revisited for that piece specially? Okay, well, I, I actually just finished um, in July uh, defending, uh, writing and defending my dissertation. Um, and my dissertation is essentially about two partnered pieces. One is Vestigia Flamme, a Sinfonietta piece, and one is Agnosco Viteris, which is an orchestra piece um, that is all about musical memories. And so I've gone down this little um, sort of artistic path recently where I've been trying to figure out who am I as a musician, um, what do I have to say, what is my identity as an artist, beyond just perhaps sound worlds, but bigger questions, you know, what, what am I trying to say, who am I, what, what's happening? Um, and I realized that what I do a lot of is, um, even within the pieces that I've written, I like to rework them and make meta-memories of, of these pieces. Um, and a lot of my work actually has to do with extra musical ideas or, or memories of ideas. And so what I've decided is that my entire musical output is essentially a sort of sonic scrapbook. Um, I'm a collector of uh, the ephemera of my life. And so I'm, I have exhaustive audio recordings. I take photos. Um, I, I have notebooks. I catalog the people that I meet um, out of fear of forgetting. Um, so I want to be able to have all of these reference points so I can go back and remember things um, that I might otherwise forget. But then I go back and I use these things also as um, generative seeds from which I make my music and my work. So most of my pieces are somehow a retelling of a sonic story of mine somehow that sort of amalgamates both my own personal um, interactions with the world and then things I read about, things that I encounter, things that I'm studying. Um, so it's, it's definitely a recurring theme. It's not always about childhood memories, of course. Um, I have another piece that deals with early musical memories, and that's colloquial for two pianos and electronics that 
uh, goes to the tradition of Russian bell ringing. And that's one of my um, earliest sonic memories. I lived down the street in Nyack from the Russian Orthodox Church. Um, and when I was bored in services, I really enjoyed listening to the bells. Um, but Trace Upon Cinders, I do want to actually point out, um, while there are some soundscapes perhaps of seagulls when you hear the flutes and the cellos playing, um, it's actually a piece about um, a memory of going to the shore and inscribing or, or etching these designs in the sand with a seashell uh, when I was a kid. And I would, you know, you'd go, you'd go in the late morning, early afternoon, I'd make these really great pieces of artwork along uh, the beach. And then in, e in the evening, as the tide would come in, eventually it would erase these drawings in a very um, emphatic and memorable way. So at the end of the day, the canvas was blank, but I had spent all day making something. So that's what the piece is about. So actually that transitions nicely into talking about electronics. Um, so when you started working with electronics, was it something that you brought your pre-existing material to, or did it take more time to develop as an interest? Uh, I started working with electronics while I was at MIT. Um, I had developed an interest in electronic music in high school, um, but I was just, I had no idea how it was made. And I remember when I was thinking about colleges, uh, my first instinct was, oh, I want to go to school for violin and music technology. I had no idea what that meant, music technology part, but I thought it was cool and probably something I wanted to do. Um, but anyway, I ended up at MIT and I studied ocean engineering and I was doing music for fun. Um, and they offered some electronic and computer music classes. So I had, this was maybe at the end of my freshman year or in my sophomore year of college, I started taking these courses. Um, and it started out with just basic studio techniques. Um, you know, we were using Pro Tools, we were doing these feedback pieces, we we're still using hardware back then, everything wasn't just, you know, electronically, uh, digitally done in, in, on the computer. Um, and then we would go and do found sound pieces. And uh, I remember getting, I had an MP3 play, uh, it was, yeah, it was an MP3 recorder and I would just go around and record everything um, that I encountered that I thought was interesting and make these pieces out of it. And I remember thinking that was really fascinating. And so perhaps that was the beginning of, um, of that interest. And then later on when I was, I was working at the MIT Media Lab as an undergrad, um, as a research assistant for Todd Macover, um, and he was doing a lot of uh, real-time applications of, um, of live performance. Uh, so it was live instruments with real-time processing. And that was the first time I think I realized that you could really take the, you know, the quote, instrumental classical side of what I was doing and mix it with the electronic side. So that was, that was also a very big um, mind-opening opportunity. Uh, and change the way that I thought about things. And that's when I really decided that I wanted to merge these two worlds together. So you've mentioned uh, MIT and you've touched upon your sort of interest in uh, interdisciplinary ideas and, and meta ideas and, and collaboration. So you do have a very unusually interdisciplinary training for a composer. So perhaps you could tell us a little bit about how your studies in science uh, influence your composing. Um, when I was at, uh, you know, I have a degree in ocean engineering, um, and so what is that? It's mechanical engineering, a little bit of electrical engineering, and it's all applied in the water. We study some acoustics. Um, I could look at these little things and say, okay, yes, I use this in my work, um, but I think the bigger thing is I learned a lot about problem solving while studying sciences and engineering and about making things. So you have something that you want to make and you have a certain number of tools and how do you use those tools to create. Um, and composing, I view it as exactly the same thing except my, um, my medium is sound. So I'm sculpting sound and musical ideas and uh, the limitations are the parameters that I decide. Um, there are also physical limitations uh, when one works with uh, live performers. 
And so I'm, I have a desired result, some sort of project in mind, and then I'm just working and manipulating and massaging and prototyping and testing things out. When they don't quite work, I can go and revise them until I finally have a finished piece. So I see the process um, being very similar to what I was doing before. Uh, in terms of any kind of poetic or extra musical inspiration. Yes, I think um, having this interdisciplinary background does pull um, greatly into my um, conceptual ideas of what I want to be doing. Um, in the last, I guess, two years, I've started to try to merge these uh, influences together a little bit more, and I've been working on a series of interdisciplinary projects where I'm collaborating now with other artists and researchers and scholars um, to make pieces of art that aren't just you know my compositions and I'm finding that to be very rewarding. Uh, one of the things I'm working on is a multimedia cantata about the Anthropocene called Making Telus um, and I'm working, uh, the project is being developed by Sugar Vendil with the Nouveau Classical Project and Andrew Munn, who is a bass vocalist. Uh, but, um, and it is about the changing geology of work, of the earth. And so when I was an undergrad, I worked at the Lamont Doherty Earth Observatory in the summer as a, in the geophysics lab as an intern. And so I'm using some of that information. We're taking um, data from different research projects and, and building it in there. We're working with a, um, a choreographer. We're working with a new media artist to do generative video for the production. We're working with a sustainable fashion designer. Um, so it's really a merging of collaborator collaborators and minds all together to make a really large scale project. Um, and music is just a portion of that. And so I think that's something I'm really beginning to enjoy. That's very exciting. Yeah, I, I hope it works out. <laughs> Yeah, that would, well, I'm, I'm curious to see what, what you all come up with. Um, it's interesting how that sort of reminds me a little bit of filmmaking because music is often considered this sort of one-way thing from composer to performer to listener. And filmmaking, what you're doing is a little bit more like filmmaking where there's all these different working parts that have to sort of mesh together and there's practical considerations along with, uh, you know, aesthetic ones and how those two things how, how all of those different things mesh is very interesting. Yes, um, and, and that's another just element of problem solving is how to navigate all of those things. And one of the things I really enjoy about this project, and uh, you know, I've been working, I guess, with a couple of other artists and projects that I finished recently, is the fact that when I'm doing this kind of work, music composition becomes a less solitary activity. Um, we're so alone when we write music, um, but we, but the act of music making is such a community affair and it always has been. Um, so as composers, we write the music and perhaps we're um, working closely with some musicians when we have questions, but it's only in the rehearsal process that you get to come together and work to work with human beings to make a project. Whereas when you're doing, I guess, one of these more interdisciplinary projects, that sense of community is there from the beginning, whether or not you want it. Sometimes I want to make it go away, but I can't. <laughs> so did founding uh, Ensemble Echepe come out of the same sort of impulse then? Oh, I, it certainly did. Um, so Ensemble Echepe, I co-founded uh, with my dear friend and violist Jocelyn Pan. And we had spent uh, the summer at Tanglewood together in 2013. And she just happened to play nearly all of my music that summer. Um, and then when we came back to New York, we realized we lived only 10 blocks from one another. We became friends. And then she asked me uh, to write a piece for her. And I did. And it was just this really beautiful, fruitful relationship and friendship. And we had a lot of other mutual friends. and we were able to work together so frequently um, and I think we just both enjoyed this very much and then she wanted me to write her a viola concerto and so I thought this was a fantastic idea um, and I said yes and then we both looked at each other and we're like okay so how do we make that happen um, because she's she didn't play in an ensemble and it would be kind of weird for me to ask some other ensembles, hey, can my friend Jocelyn come in and play a concerto with your group um, and your violist won't play it. <laughs> That's not really how it works. Um, so 
we were th- scratching our heads thinking about what to do and we thought okay we can put together a group of friends to play uh, but it'll, it, that would just be a one-off thing um, and so we thought okay maybe this is a good idea but we went and we wanted to ask someone for advice and we both have worked closely with uh, maestro Jeffrey Malarski so we asked him to have coffee and he said yes and we explained our project and our dilemma to him he thought it was delightful uh, he came up with a couple of suggestions at first, which for a variety of reasons um, wouldn't work. Uh, and then he said, okay, you know what, let's, let, let's just skip ahead to something more important. Why don't the three of us f- found a group? And he's like, you know, we'll, f- we'll put together a group. Um, we'll, yes, they'll play the viola concerto, but that's thinking small. We should think long term. Um, and, you know, we're all, we all work together. Uh, we all know these fantastic musicians. We should really have a sinfonietta. And so we thought Jeff was completely nuts, but we were excited. Um, and then we put together a roster of musicians that we would ideally like to have, this sort of dream team. And then with a lot of fear, we started scheduling um, drinks and appointments and lunches and hang sessions with each of these people to hopefully convince them that they should join the group and every single person said yes with enthusiasm and so we were really confused about this too and very excited and the next thing we knew we had a group of people who love playing together Um, they're all friends with one another and they just have such a high level of musicianship and it's a really beautiful thing. That's wonderful. And it's created another community to keep us composers from just staring at the wall all the time. (laughs) Yes, exactly. And and that's another great thing about the group is um, it's a group of 17 soloists. Uh, So yes, we function as a sinfonietta, but we also want to make sure that everybody, um, all the musicians are showcased for their individual voices. And so we've decided to... um, have a series of commissions where uh, composers will work closely with each member of the ensemble um, so that we can start developing a repertoire of concerti. Uh, And so that's really exciting. Um, And it allows us as composers not only to work with a group, but to work intimately with an individual performer, um, which I think always makes for a nice or collaborative experience. Yeah, that's wonderful. I'm, uh, I think my best uh, collaborative experiences have always been with one player. And so that's, it's kind of has the best of both worlds where you get you get the, the color and variety of a large ensemble, but you also get that personal connection with a with a really fantastic player. Mm-hmm. Yes, and it's, it's exciting. So we're going to have the first, um, this season we have our first little tastes of this. Uh, we have a concert on November 14th and Brad and Doug Balliot, who are twin brothers, Um, absolutely fantastic musicians of all sorts of genres and varieties. Uh, We, uh, and they play in our group, um, bassoon and double bass, and they have written themselves a duo concerto um, called Cryptophagia, which is about their um, twin language that developed when they were children. So they speak this very peculiar language between themselves. Um, and so this is a d- double concerto that they wrote together that they will um, premiere on November 14th. And so we're very excited about this project. That's an amazing idea. My brother and I actually have a similar kind of language, even though we aren't twins, but we still, we, you know, we talk to each other and my family don't understand what we're saying. So I, I'm very curious to hear that piece. Oh, do you? Ha- uh, and did you develop that f- since you were children, intentionally or unintentionally? I think that's the result of spending about 15 years living in the same space and having nothing but 15 years of in-jokes and references to things that nobody else could possibly ever understand. Well, you're going to have to come and listen to this piece, and then you'll have to speak with Doug and Brad about this and see if there are similarities. Yeah, I'm I'm very curious about that. That That sounds absolutely wonderful. It's a charming idea. I don't think I've heard of anything of that being introduced to music before. No, and it's, you know, I've known, I've known Brad, oh gosh, probably since 2006 or seven. We met at a summer festival in France, um, and I, I knew that he had a twin brother, but I only met his twin brother uh, at a New Year's party uh, a few years ago, 
and I walked to the front door. It was at his house. And I was like, oh, hi, Doug. And he was like, you're Nina. How do you know I'm not Brad? And I was like, I've known your brother for a really long time, and I can tell that you're not Brad. <laughs> I was like, you look really similar, but you're not the same person. But yeah, so, and I knew about this language. And so I guess when Jocelyn and I approached them about writing this piece, I was kind of hoping that they would do something of this sort. But, you know, I, I didn't have the balls enough to ask them to specifically do it. And then they came up with it on their own, which I'm very happy about. So actually, um, perhaps you could tell us a little bit about what else is on that program. I know that there's um, a piece by Kaya, Kaya Sariaho and a piece by Beat Fura and a few other people. Yep. Okay. So um, on this concert, which will be our season opener, we have six pieces. Um, so there are three ensemble pieces. Uh, and then in between these three ensemble pieces, we have three duo pieces. Um, so the highlight of the evening, of course, is this ballet duo concerto. Um, and we, uh, the other large ensemble piece that will be closing our program is Nick Omicholi's Push Pull, uh, which is a really great piece. We've been trying to, I've been trying to program this for uh, lots of different things for a couple of years. So I'm very excited that we finally get to put this on. Um, we were hoping to have it last season, but it just didn't work out. Um, and uh, in the earlier part of the program, um, I have a bassoon pocket concerto that I wrote for Brad uh, last year uh, that was premiered by Metropolis. So he'll be doing that piece again. Um, and that's a fun piece. It is, it's a small little concerto, bassoon concerto, and it is accompanied um, by flute, viola, harp, and double bass. Uh, so it's, so D Doug will be playing in that piece as well. And then around these three, uh, ensemble pieces, uh, we're doing uh, Kaya Sariajo's OEQ for bass clarinet and cello. Um, so that will open the program. Um, and the penultimate piece is Jason Eckhart's Flux for alto, flute, and cello, which is really, really an amazing piece. Um, and it's fantastic to watch musicians uh, perform it. Jason has a really amazing language. Um, that despite being challenging is so musically um, rewarding and beautiful. So I think that's going to be a, a fantastic experience. Um, and in the middle of the program, we will be giving the U.S. premiere of Bayat Führer's Ira Arca, which is a piece for bass, flute, and double bass. So you can see we're really trying to highlight um, both the bassoon and double bass in this concert. Um, and the Führer piece, uh, is all about these very intimate sounds that these two instruments make. Um, so that will be, uh, in order to actually get the full effect of this piece, um, it needs amplification. Um, so we will be showing a realer than life version of this work. And that's the program. Um, it's about an hour in length, no intermission. Um, and it should be an interesting arc to travel through, um, featuring both uh, younger and more established composers, as well as a mix of American and European voices. Last year we did an all-American season, and this year we want to start to broaden that horizon a little bit. Right. I mean, the, the thing is that uh, Echepe's programming is already pretty broad in terms of aesthetics. I mean, even though it was just American, you had a very wide range of, of voices from the American landscape. Yes, that's part of um, our musical mission uh, and to showcase a wide variety of 20th and 21st century music um, and different styles and voices. The idea being um, that I personally find it most enjoyable when I, when I go to a concert or uh, most, most rewarding, I suppose, when I go to a concert and it isn't just one aesthetic camp being played the entire time. Um, because then we start comparing um, very similar composers to one another instead of really, I think, delving into sound worlds. Uh, there's, you know, contrast is a really wonderful thing um, and it helps give us perspective. So that's something that we're trying to be keenly aware of in the program, in our programming, along with making sure that we're identifying all these different genres and styles to give a good cross section of what is happening um, in the United States and elsewhere. And our performers um, also 
are all engaged in a really wide breadth of um, aesthetics and styles of contemporary music. Um, and they all love and treat these pieces as though they are the masterworks of the um, Western musical mm -hmm. canon. Everything is done with so much care and love. Um, and from that, I think you can make beautiful music. And that's essentially what we're trying to do is just give all of these pieces the care and the attention that they deserve. Uh, so what's coming up next for you? Uh, what new works are you working on? Well, I just finished writing a solo harp piece for Emily Levine, who is the harpist in Ensemble Echappé, uh, along with being the principal harpist of the Dallas Symphony. Um, so she's really amazing uh, and, a, and just a dream player to work with and, and so musically sensitive. And she has this cool project um, that she's been working on for two years, and she is releasing a CD called Something Borrowed. And the pieces are all borrowed from other artistic sources, whether they're literary, musical, or instrumental. Um, and so one of the things that she did for this project was she commissioned a series of four composers um, to write a, uh, I guess, a collaborative new work. So each of us writes a movement. Um, and it's a set of characters pieces inspired by Shel Silverstein's poem, Invitation. So John uh, Schleiner, Will Healy, Max Graff, and myself each wrote a movement inspired by um, one of these characters. And I got the liar, L-I-A-R. So of course I played with the idea of the liar, L-Y-R-E. Um, and it's fun. Writing for solo harp is very difficult though. Uh, even though this was a, a little piece, it was rather mentally taxing to have to do that. It's, harp is not an easy, easy thing. Oh, um, I should know my mother is a harpist. I did not know that, so you must be an expert. Well, yeah, I, I still had to learn it, though. It's, it's, it's one of those instruments that so many composers just find very, very challenging. I mean, I've written for it uh, fairly extensively in orchestral language, and I have a couple of chamber pieces with harp. Um, so the mechanics of it don't boggle me too much, but it was the idea that you have seven pitches to work with. Um, and the accounting of how, how, how to deal with that and how to make changes that are, that are useful and subtle. Uh, and th that whole piece, I, the entire time I was like, I wish I had two harps. Um, I also just finished a piece uh, with uh, this performance artist named Erin Helfert that we premiered um, at Federal Hall in mid-October. Um, and so she... Uh, did this hour long performance piece uh, about that addresses uh, her experience before and after um, going through a five year rape trial in a Moroccan court. Um, and it's, yeah, it's, it's, a, it's a very dark piece, uh, but a very, uh, I think, appropriate topic considering the politics that we're going through right now in this election. Um, and so to support her project, I made an eight channel um, soundscape installation piece. Um, so some of it was fixed and then I was taking her live vocal performance um, and processing it and diffusing it in this eight channel surround system. Um, and we'll have a video of that soon and we're hoping to do different iterations of that piece in the future. Um, and then I'm and then I'm writing Jocelyn, the viola concerto, which should be done um, fairly shortly. And it's interesting because that, that project is actually co-commissioned by the Riot Ensemble, um, which Erin Holloway Nahum, a dear friend of mine, runs. And so they will premiere the viola concerto um, several days after Eshape does in May. Great. So uh, where can people find you online? Uh, just to finish up, feel free to give us your online links. Sure. I have a website, www.ninocyoung.com. Um, I also have a SoundCloud page. Um, I'm now published with Pure Music Classical, so you can order uh, scores online from them. Uh, and then I like playing on Twitter, so you can find me there as well, or on Instagram. And my Twitter handle is at Composer Nina, as is the Instagram one. 
All right, good stuff. Well, thanks very much for coming on the podcast today, Nina. This has been very interesting. It's been a pleasure. Thank you for having me. So, thank you for listening. For Composer's Notes, I'm Michael Small.